Today on the future of everything, the future of the global internet. So it sounds trite perhaps, and perhaps obvious, but the internet is everywhere. What I mean is that although it's very personal to many of us, we sometimes may forget that it is used by billions of people worldwide. Especially during the pandemic, we have each interacted with the internet pretty intimately from our homes, using it to communicate, perhaps to shop, entertainment, and even to receive services such as healthcare. But the internet is present all over the world. Do users in other countries have similar experiences? Do they share your view of the benefits and downsides of the internet? We know that cultures differ and it wouldn't be surprising if the understanding and use of the internet diff is different. How does this play out? An even more fundamental question perhaps is do our familiar internet companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and the rest, do they work the same in all places? How do authoritarian governments use the internet and how might that affect their citizens and the rest of the world? Is fake news a problem everywhere or is it more of a problem in some countries than others? Well, Julie Owono is a practitioner fellow at the Stanford Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society at Stanford University. And she is a trained lawyer and the executive director of the Internet Without Borders organization devoted to preserving an open and free internet accessible to all without discrimination. Thanks for being here, Julie. And, and my, I guess my first question is, how and why did you start the Internet Without Borders? So I did not start it, <laughs> um, but I joined it at the very early stages of, of the organization, uh, simply because of what you've just said, because I am a Black woman. I was living in France. I'm originally from Cameroon in West Africa. And uh, this space, this new space, internet at the time was providing me platforms that where I could speak and be heard. And that was very unique. Uh, people like me usually were not much seen in global conversations. So I joined the organization to ensure that the freedom of expression that I enjoy, the platforms that I enjoyed using and that you know, empowered me and made me become what I am today could be accessible as well to other women in the world, in Africa, where I'm from, in Latin America and Asia, everywhere. And basically make sure that the utopia around you know, the internet empowering people of humanity, basically, and bringing humanity closer together would become true. So that's why I joined. Were there experiences or events that put that, that made it unclear that this continued freedom would persist? Yes, there have been several. Uh, I've worked a lot in the recent years on a very preoccupying trend that has begun, I would say, with the Arab Springs in 2010, but became very, you know, almost normal in the past five to seven years. It's the issue of internet shutdown. So when governments decide for some reason or for others, valid or not, mostly not valid, uh, decide to cut off their country from the internet. Initially, it was the whole internet. You would hear that suddenly XYZ wow. country was not on the map So it's anymore. like an on off switch for the whole country. Exactly. exactly. But increasingly as the advocacy uh, that we started to do with other organization, uh, as the advocacy was becoming uh, effective in calling out these countries, well, this country decided to, and particularly calling out the fact that it was economically uh, not counterproductive, you know, everything relies on the internet today, even banking relies on internet. So when you cut off your country, well, you give up to that as well. So instead of cutting off the whole internet, they started focusing on websites that really pose them problems. And these websites are social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, the Instagram, but beyond that, even WhatsApp, Viber at some, at some point in history. So yes, it, it became very visible that there, their problem was not the fact that people was using the whole internet. It was the fact that people was, were using internet, I mean, social media platforms to call out, you know, lies by their authorities to bring attention on uh, persecutions and repression and so many other issues. Yeah, so that's, that's fascinating. And it, it raises so many questions. And, um, but let's first go to the issue of you mentioned some of these platforms. And I, and I gather from some of your reading, for some of your writings and some of your uh, talks that I've watched, that 
when I think I know Google because I use Google here in California, but is it the case that these platforms sometimes have a very different functionality or a very different performance in different parts of the world? Oh yes, um, the issues that there are so many issues. First of all, the, 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 the services and the tools that you have access to here are not necessarily accessible in other parts of the world, particularly Africa, where I, I, I work a lot. Uh, and that touches to the issue of network neutrality. You know, the network should not be able to choose what you could have access to. So that's the first problem. The second issue is we've talked a lot recently, especially in the US, about fake news, how fake news could impact. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Great. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Oh, no, no, I love it. Let's do it. Okay. okay. Um, and, and, and we've seen the responses from all of these platforms. You know, Facebook rolled out a whole bunch of new policies during the election, but even before that, in, in, uh, during the last election. And also uh, they, they've been, they've put in efforts to, you know, moderate content on these platforms. And it, it was the same. I used to live in France, in Paris, and it was exactly the same. I, I remember a very clear example when the terror attacks happened in November 2015. I mean, you could, you could really look for horrible images, but didn't find them. It was impossible. So it meant that the, the, the platforms in coordination, certainly with the authorities, had judged, and rightly so, that it wasn't okay for people to see those images. You know, there was already yes. a lot of trauma. But... Uh, I'm also from Cameroon, where there has been an ongoing crisis since 2016 with death and, and you know, tortures and, and so many are horrible things. But every day, literally at some point, I would see horrible images every single day on the timeline. On top of that, I would see people, you know, using hate speech and, um, you know, creating fractures in the society that put us on the brink of a civil war at some point. So, and that was, yes, allowed on social media platforms. The content wasn't moderated the same way that it had been, at least as I seen it in, in, in Paris. So yes, there is a, unfortunately, there is a difference in, in yes. how the services are, are provided. And that's, that's problematic. Do we understand the source of those differences? Is it that the French government was more aggressive? Is it that the uh, platforms are ignoring uh, the smaller markets? And I'm using that in quotes because uh, obviously Cameroon is a little smaller, I, I think, than France. But what, do we know why this happens? There are several reasons. Of course, the, the argument around governments being more involved is true. But uh, it also it is also true that those platforms won't reach out to all the governments around the world for various reasons, probably also because they don't want to get too cozy with dictatorships. And that's totally understandable. Uh, so th th there has been a lot of work from the part of certain governments in understanding social media and internet in general. But there is also the fact that, well, if we talk market, it is true that you know a user in I don't know random country in, in Africa. I'm sorry to use the expression. It's probably it, from the perspective of the company has less value, you know, in terms of, of money. So in terms like of their ad user, clicks and their shopping yeah. behavior may not lead to the revenue that somebody exactly. from a from a high consuming country might Absolutely, generate. For instance, but I I'm telling them that this is not the right way to think about that. Um, many of these random places, let's call them like that, send a lot of signals on what can go wrong and cost much more to platforms when those, you know, small signals backlash, basically, when they come to the US or to Europe. That's the case with fake news or Cambridge Analytica. We've mm -hmm. seen, it was known and the New York Times revealed that first before coming to the US and the Brexit debate, well, those same tools had been tested in Kenya, in Nigeria, in, in the Caribbean, and, and many other countries where, well, there are no laws, but there are users, and you know, those users are poor. So yeah, let's just try stuff on them, right? Wow, I so, did not, I had not heard that, and that's fascinating. So this was their beta testing of the Cambridge Analytica technologies before you bring it to uh, to the big time. And again, I'm using these quotes, but. Uh, yeah. Because of a lax uh, attitude or or an ability to kind of do things without any controls. 
Absolutely. These are countries where there are almost no regulation. I mean, privacy data, for instance, are not even a debate in many countries in, in Global South, as we call it. So um, yes, for us, it's and, and for me particularly, what I'm telling those platforms is that if you want to get ahead of the thread that you're, you know, that will cost you a lot when they come uh, in, in Northern America or in Europe, well, you have to pay attention to these small signals and you have to perfect your policies to perfect your tools. Well, basically use the same yeah. uh, te techniques as the bad actors who are, you know, testing their stuff on weak people. I mean, less protected people. You do, you should do that, but in, in the other way around. And you you I'm, I mean, it's going to be interesting from a market perspective for you. And beyond that, those markets, even though they do not represent that much now, they are essential to these companies. We've heard about you know, Facebook rolling out big infrastructure to connect the next billion of internet users who are all located. That's where the growth is. Global. Yes, that's where the growth is. So if you wait until those problems happen, you probably are never going to get to that growth stage. I mean, that's the argument that I try to put forward. And that's why I've, I've, I've advocated a lot uh, with these platforms to pay more, much more attention to you know, those weak signals, but that signal a lot, actually. Yeah, so, so this, this is fascinating. And again, my head is exploding with, with directions. But let me ask, could you paint a picture for what, how is the internet and connectivity working in West and Central Africa? Is it, is it ubiquitous? Are people now, in the same way that I, I would say I am at least, really quite dependent on it for everyday activities, uh, uh, commerce, communication with family. Can you just paint a picture for, is, is the internet, would I recognize the internet in, in West and Central Africa? It, it's pretty much has become essential, but then it depends whether you're in the city or whether you're in a village where there's not even electricity in the first place. Right, right. So, um, but it, it has become very important for, uh, you've mentioned commerce. There are lots of women who do hairdressing, who sell their products, they use WhatsApp because they can reach out to many customers at the same time. Um, and you've also uh, mentioned, I mean, I mentioned banking information. A lot of it, we, we talk about mobile banking in yes. many countries in, in, in Africa and particularly West and Central. So the internet is essential. Now, is it accessible? That's another problem. And no, it's not as accessible as it is in most parts uh, in the US, for instance. And that's, yeah, very worrying. Um, I, I, this is a little bit technical, but what is the penetration of smartphones uh, versus, you know, the uh, kind of old fat, what, what, what we would call uh, old fashioned Nokia flip phones and stuff like that? Because I heard that the flip phones had been because of low power usage and relative inexpensive, that they had had great penetration several years ago. And I don't know if there's been basically a continental upgrade to smartphones. Oh, yeah. oh yes, definitely. And that's thanks to cheap smartphones coming from the big east and particularly from china yes. uh, they have flooded the markets with rather accessible affordable products but that can provide almost the same standards as a you know an android here in, in northern in the northern part of the world so they really are poised to be the next big market for these uh, just as you described a couple of minutes ago all the infrastructure is getting in place or in place yes absolutely because you have we have to understand it's, it's potentially billions. That's what you know companies yes. are thinking, billions of, of consumers and also billions of information and data that you can you know, have and understand right. better and predict the future. So yes, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's an essential aspect that we should keep in mind. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Julie Owono about, uh, especially about um, internet freedoms and, uh, and access in, um, in Africa and in other uh, parts of the world. I wanted to ask you, the, um, your organization has talked about the rights and freedoms in digital space. Uh, and I find that to be fascinating because those are great words. They're powerful words. Um, are there manifestos? Are there um, uh, bills of rights uh, that you've created or thinking about create? Or, or even if there aren't, tell me about like how we should think about digital rights and freedoms. Because I can see, obviously, even in this discussion, it's clearly a two-edged coin. The, the freedom of speech also comes with responsibilities about what the types of speech that you make. And I'd just love to know how your organization is thinking about these things. So there, 
several answers to that. The first one, there have been declarations. Uh, I'm thinking about the uh, digital rights uh, declaration that was adopted in the framework of African organizations uh, signed by, I don't have the exact figure, by close to 100 organizations. Uh, but there's also, there has also been an effort in Brazil called the Marco Civil, so the Bill of Rights of, of the internet. It was adopted in 2014. So all these convert to the idea, I mean, sorry, uh, converge to the idea that we need indeed our rights to be respected in the same way online than they are offline. And it's not even me saying that, it's even the UN which adopted a resolution uh, to say that. But once you've said that, how do you translate this? That, that's right. a big question. Uh, for some, you know, you have to create something completely new uh, to reflect the, the digital age. That's not our assumption at Internet Sans Frontières, Internet Without Borders. Sorry, I said it in French. Uh, it's, it it's, sounds very beautiful in French, so I'm fine <laughs> with the French. You. Thank you. Um, that's not our assumption. Our assumption is we have frameworks already that are out there. Uh, at some point in history, governments around the world, people around the world were able to sit down and say, these are the principles and values that we agree on. And these principles are you know, gathered into a text that's called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that was the founding document of the UN, United yeah. Nations. So why don't we use the, the these unique moment in history where the greatest minds of the world came together and put this document together to, uh, to use it basically to the, to the digital world. Uh, there are several you know, initiatives towards that. One of them, I'm part of it. It's, the, it's a new institution that was created. It's called the Facebook Oversight Board. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an oversight board that makes decision on Facebook's own decision to delete content on its Facebook, uh, social media platform and also Instagram and it's very interesting because we make those decision not only based on Facebook community standards so we're not just telling hey Facebook in this case you've you've applied your own standards in a good way but we're also assessing whether or not these standards are compliant with international human rights standards so for instance is your community standards on hate speech compliant with you know, standards around freedom of expression and how you could, you should balance this with the right of security in case of conflict and in case there is hate speech. So yes, we, there are several attempts to try to interpret what does it mean to apply human rights that exist to the online, online space. And it's, yeah, it's a really fascinating uh, time in history, I think. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with our guest, Julie Owono, next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Julie Owono, and we're talking about. We were recently talking about uh, this thing called the Face Site, the Facebook Oversight Board. Sounds fascinating, and so I'd like to step back a minute and just tell us a little bit more about how it's set up. How much independence do you get? Because of course, somebody might say, "Well, they're being paid by Facebook as a rubber stamp." I'm suspecting that that's not the case. So um, tell tell us about the Oversight Board. Yes, it's, a, it's an institution that makes decisions on Facebook's own content moderation decisions. It was created in May last year, but it was the result of two years consultation around the world involving civil society organizations, experts on content moderation issues, but also freedom of expression and internet in general. And uh, it was, uh, I mean, it functioned, it's totally independent from Facebook, even on the financial perspective, because it was set up through a trust. So it's a trust to whom we report. And that okay. trust is completely independent from, from Facebook. As so well. Facebook can't fire you. Oh, no, no. <laughs> and for those who would think it's just, you know, us rubber stamping, oh my God, they would, I suspect the board would have chosen other people than the ones that are currently there because I'm always vocal. Uh, and, you know, when I disagree with Facebook, I just say it or Instagram. I just say, yes. so yeah. Uh, Are these decisions made in real time or is it retrospective? I'm very, I should let you go, but this is, I have so many questions, so please continue. Yes, no, it's in retrospective. We have 90 days on each case to make okay. a decision. Recently, we were handed the case of the former president of, of the United States, Donald Trump, and his suspension from Facebook Instagram. So we have three months to make this decision. We're, our role is not to be super moderators. So we wouldn't be able to, you know, in real time, 
make those decisions, but rather what we want to come up with is what are the principles, what are the guidelines that should guide the company when it moderates content? And for instance, in one of the decisions which was related to COVID-19 disinformation, uh, we, we told Facebook, your current policy is not clear. So there's no way you can delete content because people don't even know what they're allowed to post or not uh. because of you. So Facebook, in the aftermath of that decision, decided recently to roll out a new policy and explain why such claim would not be allowed on the platform and how they came up with that you know, restriction, working with the World Health Organization and other health experts to, yes, decide whether this speech is, you know, should be allowed or not. And I think it's a step further, definitely. So we come up with principles rather than, you know, real-time hot takes on, on content. Great, and it sounds really useful because then it feeds back, like the, that example you just gave, you were feeding back to Facebook that whatever you've written about the policies in this area, we couldn't even interpret it in a useful way. So please try again. And then as we apply it in the future, we'll tell you if it's actually working and it gives us guidelines. Yeah. And so, I, so you can tell them when the guidelines are clear. You can also tell them when there needs to be guidelines because they don't have any. Absolutely. Uh, we, we, we have done that, for instance, in another case. We recently published several cases, six of them. Uh, and, and in one of the cases, someone made a quote attributed to a former, I mean, a Nazi. Joseph Goebbels, it wasn't really him, but that doesn't matter. And we learned that Facebook had a list of dangerous organizations whose name and quotes and whatever are not allowed on the platform. And we told Facebook, we don't even know who is on that list. Right, Maybe right. we should let people know. And, and afterwards, we will probably ask you how you come up with that, with that list. But that's another, that's probably for another case. In really, case. really interesting. So I wanted to pull back a little bit. Uh, you used the, the word in your answer of uh, moderation. And this idea of content, and I understand that you're, you're, this Facebook oversight is not quite content moderation because it's retrospective and you're looking at policy level issues. But there is this question that every platform uh, struggles with, and I know you've thought about and, uh, and, and talked about, of content moderation, where you're saying, even in real time, sorry, this one is not going to the public, this one is okay. And we know that there's this exponential increase. I mean, I've recently looked at things like Reddit and of course, Facebook and Twitter, and all of them are still having growth, especially during the pandemic in terms of the posting, which, mean, which begs the question of humans will not be able to keep up with this content. And therefore you're looking at e either automated or semi-automated, perhaps right. empowered by AI, um, content moderation as the first pass. Um, you've thought a lot about this and, and, and it's, 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 it's a treacherous area. So tell me your thoughts about content moderation and, and the use of AI in that. Yes, first of all, it's going to be inevitable whether we like it or not. So once we know that, what do we do? Uh, I've been thinking about that in the past two years. Uh, we've actually tried a project uh, in, in, in a Western, in five countries in Central Africa, trying to proactively identify hate speech patterns. And what we think is crucial, even in the AI content moderation, automated content moderation, it's crucial to work with local organizations who know the context who know, you know, what what could go wrong even before the platforms will ever understand this. So, uh, we uh, have a model in which we uh, train, first of all, organization on what is hate speech because that's another issue. You know, people don't even know sometimes that you're seeing hateful content or content that should not be allowed on the platform. And even Facebook and other platforms recognize that the report button doesn't function the same way everywhere else because simply right. because people don't use it's it. It's not the same as I disagree with this statement or I don't like this person. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, in those contexts, it's important to explain um, what, 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 what hates bitch, what are the community standards. And if you see something that's not right, you should just, let's just talk about it, put it under the radar of the platforms. That's exactly what we do. We form networks, we train those organizations, and then we work with them to monitor the groups, the prominent figures, because that's where the hate speech is usually going to come from and disinformation as well. We try to find patterns. And based on what we have observed, we are, and that's the point where we are right now, we're questioning whether or not it's possible to integrate this very localized context into the automated system. Is it possible to create a data set 
of what hate speech looks like in, in a particular country based on information and data provided in collaboration with local civil society organization, you know, and not in a very opaque way in which we don't even know. We suddenly learned that this word is a slur, but we don't know why it even became a slur. Um, so yes, these are things that we're exploring. And we think it's even interesting, even for platforms, we're talking about mm -hmm. countries in which many uh, of these companies don't really know, uh, you know, what the market really looks like, you know, and having this very acute knowledge, very, you know, localized knowledge is a wealth that I think should be interesting as well from a market perspective. Yeah, this focus on local context really, it feels right to me. And, and let me just make sure I understand, because I can see that on the incoming, the local organizations can be super important at interpreting the speech and telling you, oh, what they're saying here, that is hate speech, because like those words are, are you know, are, are pow uh, you know, they're powerful words, and this is the context that makes them uh, uh, potential dynamite. Do they also help in the response to that? In other words, they can help you identify, but can they also help in like disinformation, uh, notification, and like inoculating the population to, hey, don't be fooled by these guys. They're trying to split us. They're trying to cause trouble. Um, yeah. Is it also on the outgoing that they're helpful? Absolutely. Because uh, when you think what's important in all this, you know, fight against hate speech and disinformation, the human element is essential. What we have seen uh, once we had trained this local organization, in their turn, they become, you know, advocates and trainers in their own communities and the local media, and they raise awareness basically around these issues. Yes. We, we, we made a, a test in, in Cameroon, which was, I think, quite successful, uh, in which at some point, like I was saying, every time you would open Facebook, you would see, you know, dead bodies, horrible words and stuff like that, disinformation even. So we, uh, we, we tried this project, we trained people, and these people now ha have, you know, created a fellowship against hate speech and disinformation, you know, in which they train other people. And, 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 and yeah, it has a, it, it's, yeah, it has a rather positive effect. So I, I would say that it's not only from the technical perspective that this is interesting, it's also from human and macro perspective, it's interesting for the society as a whole. So yeah, that's- It is a great way to give all of us hope for how, uh, strategies for um, combating disinformation and hate speech. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.